Hi, my name is Steven Svoboda, and it's a pleasure to be presenting here for the International Conference on Men's Issues. Hats off to Mike Buchanan and his loyal crew. Very impressive lot. Great things they've done over the years. Such a shot in the arm for those of us who want genuine gender equity, which presumably includes all of us here today. <clears throat> so my talk is called All Animals Are Equal, But Some Are More Equal Than Others, Petition petitioning the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn the military draft as sex discrimination against men and women. And we'll get into meanings of various parts of the title later. So my day job is as a patent lawyer. That means if somebody invents an idea that we think is new and not obvious, it's my job to write it up and send it into the U.S. Patent Office and sometimes other patent offices. So as you might guess, this is pretty much as far as you could possibly get from the front lines of litigation and legal work. Now, I did found a nonprofit in 1997 devoted to stopping all forms of genital cutting called Attorneys for the Rights of the Child. Mike's been a great comrade in that battle, and um, as has Harry Crouch of NCFM. And so because of that organization, I have been involved in two litigation cases, enough, I litigated two cases with partners, enough to decide that I never wanted to do it again. So I'm your friendly neighborhood physicist writing up ideas and thinking that there's no chance I'm ever going to do anything that's going to involve any important court, let alone the U.S. Supreme Court, right? But I do have on my wall a U.S. Supreme Court membership, which a supporter of our organization about 15 years ago decided they wanted me to have. I think the idea was I was going to bring a circumcision case to the U.S. Supreme Court, which, of course, hasn't happened yet. Um, but in any event, the Supreme Court became more immediate in my life, and I was fortunate enough to be able to work on a case that we brought to the Supreme Court on a very important issue with the National Coalition for Men, NCFM, of which Harry Crouch is president and I'm the public relations director, have been for uh, over two decades now. So um, how did that happen? Well, we had a very prominent, very successful totally amazing, honestly, civil rights lawyer named Mark Angelucci, who was a very close friend of mine, uh, closest friend of mine who's ever passed, actually. He was at my wedding. And a little over a year, well, there was a lawyer, this sort of rogue lawyer on the East Coast who wanted to be involved with Mark in this same case we're talking about, a lawsuit against the Supreme Court about the military draft in the U.S. And Mark, quite rightly, because I knew this guy too and he was a total nutcase, didn't want to get involved with him. Well, he got mad, took a train out, if you can believe this, from New Jersey to California, which is something on the order of 3,000 miles, 5,000 kilometers, went to Mark's house, posed as a delivery person in a uniform, had a package, his roommate said, oh, I'll take it. The delivery person said, no, I need to deliver it to Mark. Mark walked out and he shot him dead. Then he went back to New Jersey and, as you may have heard, also trying to kill a judge in this same case, killed the judge's son, unfortunately. So we then had the issue, in addition to grieving and you know picking up the pieces in, in many ways from Mark's absence, a hole that no one can ever fill. We had the practical issue of figuring out what are we doing with the Supreme Court case because Mark, of all people, would have wanted us to continue and persist with it. So there were a couple of different law firms, organizations that were willing to consider taking this case on it with us as the plaintiffs. Um, but we ended up working with the American Civil Liberties Union of, of all people. They were our lawyers, the ACLU Civil Rights, Women's Rights Project. Now, if you, if you get to know the ACLU, which I didn't really until this case, despite the fact I was a, a member a few decades ago um, in my 20s, if you get to know the ACLU, you find out there's actually a lot of different organizations. They have quite a complicated structure. So that 
ACLU Women's Rights Project is the exact entity that Ruth Bader Ginsburg worked with before she went to the Supreme Court. And in fact, she made her name bringing cases on behalf of women, um, sort of saying, well, these laws that are intended to create gender equity need to work both ways, and so they need to work on behalf of women's equality. Well, yes, and they also need to work on behalf of men's equality which is why we were concerned about one of the last remaining vestiges, explicit, totally explicit um, vestiges of sex discrimination, the military draft. Um, we we're only asking for a de declaration that the draft was illegal. It, we weren't asking for any money. And so the question people sometimes would ask us right off the bat is, well, do you want the draft to be made to include women or do you want the draft to end? And we didn't take a position on that we thought it was better strategically not to. We, we wanted the sexes to be treated equally, and that's all we were asking for. So um, give a little background, and especially for our non-US-based listeners, the United States Constitution guarantees all residents equal protection of its laws. The 14th Amendment to the US Constitution does this for state and local governments, and the Fifth Amendment guarantees equal protection from the federal government. Equal protection is essentially a direction that all people be treated alike. The concept being that discrimination by itself is harmful, causes serious injuries to people. So to give a little background on uh, the draft, and probably not even a lot of Americans are aware of all the details of this, um, I have a personal involvement as I'll explain, so I am. but. Since 1948, Congress has authorized the president to require every male person residing in the United States to celebrate their 18th birthday by registering for the draft. To register, a man must provide his name, date of birth, social security number, and street address. Thereafter, he has a continuing obligation to notify the Selective Service within 10 days, which is a really short timeline. If anything changes, including a change of address, and he must continue <coughs> to do so until he's 26 years of age. Men who fail to register face just an astounding range of penalties, criminal prosecution, denial of federal student loans, denial of civil service jobs, denial of job training assistance, disenfranchisement as voters, disqualification from citizenship, and a host of other penalties. If convicted, they can be fined up to $250,000 and can be imprisoned for five years. Moreover, many states will not renew a driver's license for failing to register with the SSS, Selective Service System. More than 30 states refuse state financial aid, state employment, or both, and eight states bar men from enrolling in public colleges and universities. And guess what? There's another penalty to register for the Selective Service, for not registering for the Selective Service. Oh, right. If you register for the Selective Service, you can be drafted. The potential to be involuntarily called to serve, which is what the draft is intended to make possible, to leave one's home and family and risk one's life, whether in combat or any other military role in a foreign theater, is obviously a heavy obligation. And it is one that, under current law, only men must carry. Women have no such responsibility and face no life-changing consequences for failing to register for the draft. Let me just say a little bit of how it played out in my life, because it may be of slight interest. So I was born in February 1960. If I was born December 31st, 1959, I would not have to register for the draft. But because I was born after January 1st, 1960, I was required to register for the draft. And I went to, let's see, 15 quarters of undergraduate, four, quarter, four semesters of Berkeley physics, that's 19, and uh, six semesters of law school, 25, periods of academic study, each one of which, of course, had to be paid for, and it wasn't cheap even back then, and no aid of any sort, no loan, no grant of any sort could be obtained by a man unless he could show proof that he'd registered for the selective service. Well, what did I do? My family's not super rich, so that wasn't the answer. I looked at the card. They gave a little card back in the day, a three-by-five card that you had to fill out with a pen and with a pen. Not how it would be done today, presumably. And the card had various reasons on it why you don't have to register for the draft. I'm a woman was one reason. I was born before 1960 is another reason. Presumably, I do not live in the United States. 
was another reason. So what I did was I took the excuse that said I was born before 1960. I struck out the word before so I wasn't committing perjury. I wrote in in there and I checked that one. Now, I knew very well that being born in 1960 was not an excuse not to register for the military draft, but I just gave this a shot. It was the only thing I could think of. And guess what? 25 academic periods. Each academic period, I did the same thing. Not once did someone come back to me and say, uh, Stephen, or actually Jeff was my name because my first name is Jeff. Jeff, what the heck? You didn't check, you, you checked the box, it doesn't make sense. You were born in 1960. No one ever said that. So it worked, basically. <clears throat> and I also knew that if I ever ended up on a battlefield, my life expectancy was probably about three minutes. It's just not one of my skill sets. And I was realistic enough to know that. Besides which, I'm not a huge fan of, of the military, but that wasn't even the main concern. But enough about me. Um, but the, the, the larger point really is that <clears throat> the draft affects all males in a way that no females are affected. Now, maybe some female, well, certainly some females are spouses of males, sisters of males, mothers of males, so it affects them indirectly. But no females are affected directly by definition because that's how the law is written. And I, I actually had a roommate when I was at UCLA, at UCLA lining out that card every quarter and getting away with it. I had a roommate who, unlike me, was a public draft resistor. So he basically had press conferences, you know, went to the government, said, hi, government, my name is Mark Larilla. That was his name, Mark Larilla, L-A-U-R-I-L-A. I still remember. It's been 40 years. Hi, my name is Mark Larilla. I don't believe in the draft. I'm not registering for the draft. Here's where I live if you're interested in arresting me. And I feel really good about my decision. Thank you very much. Well, he did get arrested. He spent a couple of years in prison. So that, that's what happened. But people like me who were not public about it usually weren't actually put in jail, prison, although we certainly could have been. We were certainly theoretically um, violating that law. All right. So um, the, the, the thing that's gotten interesting about this whole topic as we'll get into a little more detail about in a minute, is that the Department of Defense itself in the U.S. has concluded that the male-only um, draft registration requirement undermines military interests, and yet it somehow still stood for four decades as one of our few, most potent and few, remaining public expressions of ancient falsehoods about men and women. So even back in the 60s and 70s, Congress eliminated prohibitions on women serving in ships and at the highest levels of the military. And um, then the ACLU, um, same organization, brought a case in 1981 to the Supreme Court that had two male plaintiffs who were challenging the military draft. And the case won at both the district court level, the first court, and then the appeals court, holding that equal protection was violated, which seems pretty common sense, by something that treats men and women completely differently, putting one of them at risk of dying and being put in prison and getting huge financial penalties and the others at no obligation at all seems pretty obvious. Um, but the, the Supreme Court decided in the Rostker versus Goldberg 1981 case with a vigorous dissent from Justice Thurgood Marshall, may he rest in peace, the Supreme Court held that because women were not allowed in combat, men and women were not similarly situated, and thus an analysis of equal protection did not apply to these circumstances. Well, th that case was actually wrong, we believe, when it was decided, and we'll get into that a little more later, they used the wrong standard. But to, to move ahead with the chronological story a little more, in 2012, the military opened over 14,000 positions previously close to women, and in early 2013, the Department of Defense rescinded the ban on women in combat. After three years of extensive study, or so they termed it, the, the U.S. Defense Secretary in 2015 determined that women should have the opportunity to serve in any position. Women are now permitted to drive tanks, fire mortars, lead infantry soldiers into combat. They can be Green Berets, uh, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, Marine Corps Infantry, Air Force Parajumpers, and everything else that was previously open only to men. They can be whatever they want. Great. The Department of Defense made the decision, and they made it on the basis of what would enhance our military preparedness. They found no compelling reason 
for continuing male-only registration because the dynamics of the modern-day battlefield are nonlinear, meaning that these ideas about the clearly defined frontline and safer rear area are not so valid anymore. Warfare today requires intelligence, communication specialists, linguists, logisticians, medical personnel, drone operators, cyber operators. Non-combat positions make up four out of every five positions in today's military occupations. So given increasingly diverse military needs, um, this draft that excludes approximately 50% of the population, the female half from availability in the case of a national emergency just makes no sense and isn't consistent with how the military is now addressing their needs. So shortly after the Department of Defense order in 2013, NCFM and two individual plaintiffs who both registered for the draft, two individual male plaintiffs, filed a lawsuit against the Selective Service System seeking to change the system so that it's gender neutral. In February 2019, the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas issued a judgment granting summary judgment for NCFM, for us. <clears throat> we basically won in a preliminary, preliminary stage because our case was so clear in the district court's opinion. The district court found that Rostker is no longer controlling precedent because the factual circumstances underpinning the decision had changed. Um, the dispositive fact in that decision that women are ineligible for combat is not true anymore, so it can no longer justify the gender-based discrimination. And as we've said before, laws discriminating on the basis of sex violate equal protection. To pass muster, hypothetically, this law would have to be shown to both serve important governmental objectives and be and the discrimination be substantially related to the achievement of those objectives. The court held that male-only draft registration could no longer survive this scrutiny because there's no su such substantial relationship. And the respondent's argument to the contrary smacked of archaic and overbroad generalizations about women's preferences and were the byproduct of, of a traditional way of thinking about females that we're no longer doing in this country and in this world, or at least we're no longer admitting that we're doing. Regardless of everyone's precise beliefs about these things, and beliefs will definitely vary, beliefs about women in the military will definitely vary, like it or not, and some of us do not like it, others of us do like it, but like it or not, this is the world we live in. However, surprisingly, we have three levels of courts in the U.S., and so the case, again, had to go to the um, Federal Circuit Court. Surprisingly, the Federal Circuit Court overturned that decision. It said basically only the Supreme Court can overturn the Rostker decision, which was surprising to us because it was just so clear that Rostker had been decided in a world that was so different in such a directly relevant way that it, it didn't really have any relevance anymore. It seemed like the perfect case to overturn a 40-year-old precedent. But the Fifth Circuit held, no, we can't do that. It's the Supreme Court. So we needed to look for our lawyer, as I, t I talked about at the beginning of this talk, since Mark Angelucci had been sadly assassinated. And um, we were lucky, lucky enough, after some looking around, to come across the ACLU. And things looked really good and were, in fact, really good almost uniformly, there was an exception that I'll get to toward the end of this talk, but um, we liked them. They seemed to get where we were coming from. Um, we felt like we got where they were coming from. Of course, we didn't totally agree on every last point. I mean, the ACLU does have a number of sort of um, activities they take in support of standard feminism that uh, most, most men's rights or all men's rights groups could not support. But they were so reasonable and, and um, open to our thinking and appreciative of our thinking. And I, I think one of the tricks was that we're both NCFM and the ACLU are organizations that stand on principle. Um, they're different principles, but they're still both principles. I mean, NCFM is interested in making sure that no gender-based discrimination happens. We don't get involved in gay, lesbian issues, we don't get involved in any issue that doesn't directly relate to differential treatment of men and women. And so we, we kept a, a narrow focus, which many of us really appreciate, including President Harry Crouch, Mark Angelucci, and, and I also do. It's, it's just such a great group to work with, and I feel so privileged. So um, our task was to um, 
meet with ACLU in, in detail. We had several lengthy video meetings, a number of phone calls, and of course many emails, just countless emails. And um, we agreed to approve each other's press releases and hopes were basically running pretty high, I have to say. Um, we felt like our position was solid. And, and the nice thing about it, too, was that we weren't running upstream against de developments in society. We were running consistently with developments in society in the sense that women, as I've said, are getting more and more into more and more different endeavors, both in the military and without. There's more acceptance of that. And discrimination is just being less and less tolerated in many different guises, even against some groups that weren't even being mentioned 40 years ago, but certainly as far as um, sex discrimination goes. So um, our argument, well, our argument was, first of all, the question is, what do we do about Rosker? Well, our argument was that Rosker used the wrong standard because the correct standard would have been whether excluding women from registration was substantially related to furthering the government's interest in raising and supporting armies. That would be what they would have to show to justify equal protection. Excluding women was necessary to their goal, but they instead asked whether including women was necessary to meet that interest in protecting the U.S. security, which is the wrong question legally. So Rosker basically absolved the government of its burden to demonstrate that excluding women from registration would advance military readiness. So Rosker was wrong when it was decided. And we certainly said to the, said to the um, U.S. Supreme Court, even if it wasn't wrong when it was decided, it's certainly wrong now. So to get a case to the Supreme Court, you have to get what's called certiorari granted, C-E-R-T-I-O-R-A-R-I. -E -R -R Not many cases are granted certiorari. You file a certiorari petition, and something on the order of 1% to 2% of these cases are actually granted. The Supreme Court picks and chooses what they think are the most important issues. If there's a conflict between different circuits, that draws their interest between different circuit courts. If there's a previous U.S. Supreme Court decision that may need re-examination, that draws their interest, and that was one of our hopes was was based on that. Um, but it's not easy, and we knew that. We knew it wasn't guaranteed or anything. And um, so, in any event, the three of us. I'm, I, I should say that the three of us was Harry Crouch, president of NCFM, who's just done an awesome job, so many ways, many years with NCFM, and my hat is off to him. And the other member of our team besides myself was Al Rava, who has brought many UNRWA Act cases in California. Now, the UNRWA Act is a law forbidding uh, discrimination in um, public establishments, basically stores and the like. And of course, all these ladies' nights and such things are the sort of things that um, Al has been very involved in, in suing over. And he's very familiar with men's issues. So the, the three of us made a real crack team and a, a tight team that worked closely with the ACLU. We bounced quite a number of drafts back and forth. And one of the things we were doing was pre was preparing um, amicus briefs. So amicus is Latin for friend. Uh, amicus curiae, meaning friend of the court. So when you, when you file a certiorari petition, you're not obliged to, but it makes your case stronger if you can find some good amici, which is the plural of amicus, friends of the court to write briefs in your support. And a friend of the court is an entity, could be a person, could be an organization, could be both, that is not involved in the litigation. It's somebody who has some interest in the litigation. So if you had a case about racial discrimination and you were in the US, you might involve the NAACP, for example, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So we had the opportunity to choose our writers of the friend of the court briefs. We ended up with three. The first one was written by a consortium of military officers, including the nation's first black female four-star general. And they basically argued, well, first of all, they said, we're retired military officers. We've played critical roles in debating military policy, critical roles in the readiness of the armed forces. Forty years ago, they continued, the Rosker case was decided based on this idea that women as a group weren't eligible for combat. They added, and I quote, whatever that rationale's merit was in 1981, it is no longer true. Our armed forces draw from the strength of the entire nation, not only its men. 
Indeed, women now comprise 17% of the armed forces. This evolution reflects the military and policymakers' considered judgment about how the nation's security needs are best met. Well, well done. Who are we to second guess the experts? The question of women in the military has already been answered according to these writers of this amicus brief. They concluded, there remains no military justification for maintaining the male-only selective service registration requirement. Pretty convincing in my mind, in our minds, both NCFMs and ACLUs. A uh, second amicus brief was submitted by a coalition of four veterans organizations dedicated to improving the U.S. military and fighting discrimination in the armed forces. Since the nation's founding, disenfranchised Americans have been excluded from equal participation in military service, according to these writers, based on many of the same prejudices and arguments used to deny these groups their basic rights and liberties in civilian society. First African Americans, then LGBT people, and finally women were excluded. Continued discrimination should not be countenanced. The third and perhaps most memorable of the three groups was a group of five nonprofits led by the National Organization for Women Foundation, the NOW Foundation. They said the classification, I'm quoting, the classification embodied in the MSSA, the Selective Service Act, requiring men to register but not women, reflects a familiar stereotyping of sex roles. Women are meant to be left at home to care for the family while men are meant to go to war to fight for their country. This division of roles between women who need protection and men who can provide it can no longer be maintained. They continued, Congress's decision in the Rosker case 40 years ago to exclude women from the male-only draft registration requirement denies women a key aspect of their citizenship. To reap equal rewards of citizenship, women must equally bear its burdens. We'll get back to that. This court affirmed that principle when it held that women cannot be excluded from mandatory jury duty, of course, in another case. It held that anything less than equal participation makes women second-class citizens who are unable to fulfill their obligations as full members of society. The same holds true here. So here we are, NCFM, writing a brief to the Supreme Court with the ACLU Women's Rights Project. And I have to say it was just a thrill to be working with these fine lawyers, to be working with Al Rava and, of course, Harry Crouch, and to actually, to my astonishment, <laughs> writing a petition that actually got filed in the Supreme Court. There are words that I wrote that are sitting in D.C. right now. Is that incredible or what? I'm this geeky patent lawyer. I, who, who could have guessed that? Anyway, it's funny. So sitting there and taking all this in, let's read that sentence again. To reap equal rewards of citizenship, women must equally bear its burdens, or so says the Now Foundation. Is anyone else having the same reaction I'm having? That's nice of you to say now, Foundation. It would have been nice if feminists had observed this principle over the past half century, as pretty much every single thing we heard out of now was opposed to this idea of responsibilities for women as well as rights. Anyway, glad to finally have it explicitly acknowledged. Thank you. The one amicus brief that our opponents were able to muster came from a coalition of military officers and three military organizations. The brief argued that physiological differences between men and women still support differential treatment. It further argued that sub substituting the court's judgment for that of Congress on the crucial issue of national defense is not appropriate. And they argued for more time, but there's, there's been arguments that the draft is being studied and more time is needed forever, basically. So those arguments don't really pass muster. And, and there's a funny side to this thing about arguing that physiological differences between men and women still justify differential treatment because the military itself seems to disagree. So it's just, it's, it's not a winning argument. So we felt pretty positive as we awaited the decision. On April 15th, 2021, which is tax day in the U.S., without making any attempt to justify the male-only draft registration system, the Biden administration asked the Supreme Court not to grant certiorari. So we argued in our petition, men-only registration is indefensible as a matter of law because it is rooted in impermissible assumptions about men and women. Restricting the registration requirement to men discriminates against both men and women, promotes invidious stereotypes that undermine women's place as equals in society and inflict real harms. These harms are actually felt by American service women, we argued. These harms are also felt by men, including petitioners, who are forced to comply with a discriminatory law or face imprisonment and real genuine threats to our lives. 
There's a government ad that provides a case in point. It's only 30 seconds long, but they pack a lot of stereotypes into that 30 seconds. It urges young men to register for the draft, yet we see a mother drying dishes in the kitchen, of course, because men don't know how to dry dishes, everybody knows that, nagging her son, who has just turned 18, to just do it now before you forget. Her son, skinny and squeaky, pulls out his phone, registers, and magically is transformed into this buff, deep-talking adult. Whoa! Johnny, the mother exclaims, while his little sister looks on in amazement, you're a man! So this is what it takes to be a man, is the message. Put your body at risk, put your life at risk. There you have it. Rostka was wrong, our argument continued when it was decided. The court ultimately decided one form of sex discrimination by reference to another, rather than examining whether the combat ban was itself discriminatory. So, are we going to get rid, finally, after 40 years, of one of the last few explicit forms of sex discrimination in federal law in the U.S., or not? In upholding the men-only registration requirement, Rosker relied heavily on women's ineligibility for combat, which we know is very old news. These ideas about men are supposed to go out and protect the country, and women are supposed to stay home, and keep themselves sheltered where they're safe. They used to have a lot of appeal, and they, I know they still do for a lot of us, a lot of people in the U.S. and elsewhere, but you can't say them in 2021. You certainly can't use them to create policy that's going to survive the scrutiny of the feminist-influenced organizations and feminist organizations that have so much power these days. So basically it doesn't fly. And in this case, it worked in our benefit as well. And one nice lesson from this is if we want to craft good arguments that are, be compelling, that are going to be compelling for male equality, it's good if we can refer to the female side of things, which is exactly what the ACLU did in our case. They referred to how these, the, the male-only draft harms women by excluding them from certain hallmarks of citizenship, by giving the impression to service women that they aren't as qualified, and it hurts men obviously, by sending them off to die, potentially, taking away college aid, unless you scribble on some card, um, take away uh, jobs, take, take away so many things, I mean, the right to vote, citizenship, in some cases. So the interesting context of this case, too, is that since this court first recognized that equal protection protects against sex discrimination, which is quite some time ago, and it has granted certiorari, in other words, it has allowed Supreme Court review in dozens of cases involving sex-based classifications, and almost always these get invalidated, including cases affecting the military. At the heart of these decisions is the recognition that when persons are excluded from equal participation in our democratic processes solely because of race, or in this case gender, the promise of equality dims. Limiting the registration requirement to men reinforces these archaic stereotypes which end up with women, not on a pedestal, but in a cage. Men get their own form of stereotype at the same time. So, a memo to myself, memo to others working in these issues, to keep in mind, it always plays great when you can craft things in ways that protect both men and women. This was what Ruth Bader Ginsburg did many years ago. Unfortunately, she passed away before our case was heard because we figured she was likely to be one of our biggest advocates. There was an unfortunate event that happened later in the process. The ACLU and NCFM were both lining up press releases in case we won the petition to take the case to the Supreme Court and in case we lost. And the ACLU threw into their proposed releases some very odd quotes about LGBTQ issues that had nothing to do with the case. The case was about sex discrimination. Andre Segura, the legal director for the ACLU in Texas, wrote in a draft of their release, the road to full equality for men, women, and the LGBTQ community remains long, but we cannot allow continuation of one of the last remaining vestiges of gender discrimination in federal law. So the road to full equality for men, women, and the LGBT communi LGBTQ community remains long. Well, what is the LGBTQ community doing in this sentence? There is nothing about gender discrimination in this case. Nothing. I guess the ACLU wanted to bring the issue in. They want the LGBTQ communities to know that the ACLU is supporting them, but it's such a non sequitur. And to make it even worse, when the release came out, men were taken out. So we're talking about the road to equality for women, women in the LGBTQ community in a case that, let us not forget, 
is about stopping male draft registration, male-only draft registration, that leads to men being jailed, fined, robbed of citizenship, robbed of the right to vote, uh, losing funding for college, and, by the way, having to go off and fight in wars. And as we've already acknowledged, some w women have been adjudged by the military to be totally competent to do that, and rightly so. So the mind boggles. Um, we tried to clean things up with the ACLU, and you know we had a great relationship with them throughout the whole case, and so this was just a pity to finish on this note, and while the drafting was going on before the final certiorari decision, the certiorari decision came out on June 7th, and then the press release abruptly got issued with this non sequitur LGBTQ reference that we had explicitly not agreed to okay, and remember we had agreed to okay each other's press releases prior to release. So that was unfortunate. In any event, the case was decided against us. The Supreme Court uh, will not be deciding about the constitutionality of the military mail-only draft uh, anytime soon. And uh, there's so many ironies. Justice Kavanaugh was one of the main ones who supported denying certiorari, and he apparently wanted to re-ingratiate himself with feminists and with the majority on the court or the people on the court that are more um, liberal-leaning. And... Uh, in July 2021, the, week the month after the decision, the Senate Armed Services Committee approved language in its annual defense policy to require women to register for the draft. So that was interesting. And then the final note is leaving men out of that statement by Andre Segura, the road to full equality for men, women, and the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community remains long. There, I don't believe is a more marginalized group or group attacked more and more openly and more brazenly in today's ultra identity politics than heterosexual men and especially those of a certain lighter skin color. We can't even talk about how we are marginalized. That's how marginalized we are. Most people laugh in our faces if we mention it. Men are left out of all these discussions despite sentencing discrimination, shorter lives, military draft discrimination, family court discrimination, so many injustices that many of us are working to correct. So. That was the final bittersweet footnote to our obviously very disappointing inability to bring the case to the Supreme Court. But the work continues. There are so many awesome, phenomenal, committed, dedicated activists out there, both male and female, working hard for genuine gender equality. I bless every one of you. I'm grateful to be able to meet many of you um, when the ICMI happens in person to talk face-to-face -face with many of you, and even in an online forum at online ICMI events such as this. And my hat's off to all of you, so thank you so much, and thank you for listening.